I'm so pleased to welcome you, President Biden, Vice President Harris, to CDC today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to spend time with us. Before we begin our COVID engagement, I want to take a few minutes to recognize the horrific shooting that occurred earlier this week in Atlanta. I want to extend my sympathy and support to those affected and to their friends and loved ones. Here at CDC, we stand against hate, stigma, and discrimination. We see it as our work every single day to combat racism and, the, and address the impacts it has on health. Mr. President, your leadership over COVID-19 pandemic from day one has instilled confidence and reinvigorated our whole of government response. It has reinvigorated me personally and this entire agency. Your support for CDC is so important to the hundreds of CDC staff and leaders listening today into this session. CDC has a long history of leading our nation through unprecedented public health challenges. We are so grateful for your working so hard for fighting to provide the critical resources we need to end this pandemic. As you know, CDC has provided substantial support for vaccination implementation, which is achieving increasing numbers of shots in arms week by week and doing so in an equitable way. And today, day 58, <laughs> we hit our goal of 100 million vaccinations in arms. I am so energized by the future, and yet we still have so much more work to do. While you're here, I'd like to give you a few updates regarding some of our other COVID-19 response activities, those you may be less familiar with. First, Dr. Henry Walk, the tireless and completely unflappable <laughs> incident manager, will give us a brief update on the state of the pandemic and the CDC response. And then Dr. Leandris LeBird, the CDC Response Chief Health Equity Officer, will talk about some of our early community-based engagements supporting our response. So with that, thank you, and I will turn it over to Dr. Walk. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walensky, and um, wow, what a pleasure. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, just really welcome to CDC. And before I get started, I, I have the pleasure really to, um, to speak here, but uh, there are responders in this room and thousands of responders on the um, on the phone who really have worked tirelessly, worked hard, sacrificed, and their families have sacrificed as well. So I, I really want to acknowledge that. I want to go over uh, three slides with you. Uh, this one um, is looking at cases per 100,000 population, and it's in a in a in a pattern of the U.S. So each box, each small box is a state or a jurisdiction. So Maine is up here, Florida's here, Alaska's on the top left there, California on the top, on the, on the lower left, and then Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands here in the ocean somewhere. Um, so on the x-axis of each box is cases per 100,000, and on the, on the y-axis is cases per 100,000, on the x-axis is time. So we're looking at cases over 30 days. So, and the colors, um, just to, are really indicating the level of transmission. So red and orange, high levels, alarming of transmission. Yellow and blue are more reassuring. So a couple things to, to point out here. One is there's a lot of red, there's a lot of orange. So still a lot of transmission uh, throughout the country at the moment. But you'll see in the, in the Northeast region um, over time, really high um, elevation of case rates and sustained over time. If we look at New York City or New York or Rhode Island, we have high case rates that are maintained over time. Versus this, the uh, Southeast, Georgia and South Carolina have high rates, but in the last two weeks we see a decline. Oregon over there is in the yellow, and then California, the rates are lower and continue to come down. So there's a lot of regional variability across the country. Um, and so and we're tracking this and reaching out to individual states as we see increases. Also lately in the past week and a half, um, Michigan and Minnesota start to have a slight increase in their case rates. And so we're reaching out to those states trying to understand what's happening and see if we can help them more. 
But let's move to, to this one, um, the community transmission levels. So that's by state and territory. This is by county. So on the, on the y-axis, we have over 3,000 counties in the, in the country. So that's count of counties. And then on the x-axis, we have time from January 2020 to March of 2021. And the colors here are similar to the other, other slide. Red and orange are alarming. Yellow and blue are reassuring. And so you'll see in terms of counties, low transmission. And this, this community transmission, I should say, also includes cases per 100,000, but also percent positivity. So in each county, of all, the, of all the tests that are done, what percent of them are positive? 10%, 5%, 2%. So we connect those two together and come up with this transmission level. So the good news is, if, is that it's going down over here. Here's where we are now. But you see, if you let your eyes follow the contour of the red, you'll see the three peaks of the epidemic in the US. Now, we have about 27% of counties in the US are moderate or low. And that continues to increase every week. This is important to us because we connect these community transmission levels to our guidance. So we released today or updated our K through 12 guidance and allowing at least three feet in the classroom for children. But as community transmission levels increase, we have additional recommendations, more testing of teachers and staff and students, as well as more restrictions around extracurricular activities because we've seen a lot of outbreaks basically in, with sports um, in schools. The last slide I wanted to talk about is this one, and you may have heard a lot about a variants. Um, and the virus that causes COVID-19 continues to mutate, and some of these mutations are worrisome. And so we've been following these mutations over time, and some of these mutations may affect our vaccine efficacy or effectiveness, our therapeutics, whether they're effective or not, or drugs, and also our tests, are they useful or not? And so we're tracking, using whole genome sequencing, these variants across the whole country, and we're, we're trying to escalate and expand that capacity now and hope to have a lot more capacity in the future. So just looking, this is nationwide, we're looking at variants nationwide. So this is, we're looking uh, on the y-axis is the variant share, on the x-axis is week. This is time zero today. So we're looking back six weeks, 12 weeks. So this is, this is three months ago. So three months ago, this variant in teal, let's call it, uh, B1.2 was wild type. So been circulating in the US for a long time. But you see it's being replaced with this variant um, in olive here B117. This is the one that we're concerned about in the UK and Europe, and is more transmissible, more infectious. So we're in a race with our vaccination rates, our mitigation, continuing to mask and distance as we get this type of emerging variant um, like B117. We think B117 will be the predominant variant in the US probably by the end of March of this month. Now, here, in uh, region two, I wanted to show you there's variability in the regions. Region two includes uh, New York and New Jersey primarily. In region two, we see a pattern where this is wild type being replaced by B117, but here in orange, there's another variant that's emerging, a B526, 1526. And why is this important? Because, so you see, and it's actually a pretty substantial proportion now, um, this, this particular variant um, is resistant against one of our monoclonals, one of our drugs that we're using for, uh, for therapeutics to treat. So right now we're discussing within the US government, big US government, People around- listening. make it clear it's the therapeutics, not the vaccine. Correct. Because these guys are picking that up. So yeah, that's right. So it's a important. drug. It's a drug. It's a drug that's used you know, early, but yep. even before you go into a hospital, one of these drugs that kind of prevent hospitalization or might prevent death. Please understand, I wasn't correcting you. I just know from experience yeah. that. No, thank you. you. Conflate it. Yeah. No, no, thank you very much. So um, anyway, this one, this 526 is resistant against one of these monoclonal drugs. And we're going to give recommendations around changing to a separate drugs, maybe combination drugs 
that are that will be effective against this particular uh, variant. So I just I want to end there, and uh, we can talk more if you have questions. Do you do you have any questions? Oh, okay, thank you. So let me turn it over to Dr. LeBird. Thanks, Henry, and let me add my welcome to you, um, President Biden and Vice President Harris, for being with us in this historic moment in public health. It is is such an honor. This will be in our history forever, so thank you for your presence. Um, we observed early in the pandemic that racial and ethnic minority populations were experiencing a disproportionate burden of COVID-19, not only infection, but also severe illness and death. And so with an initial focus on testing and educating communities about COVID-19 and the mitigation measures, last summer, um, we funded three national organizations to accelerate the dissemination of prevention messages in communities of color. And if you look at the first slide, um, the organizations were the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, uh, Proceed Incorporated, which is a national Hispanic and Latino serving organization, and the CDC Foundation, which allowed us to reach historically black colleges and universities and other academic institutions. These organizations were uniquely situated to connect with other national minority organizations with easy access to local community groups that were trusted and that were longstanding institutions in African American, Hispanic and Latino, and Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Native Hawaiian communities. So by partnering with just three national organizations and tapping into their networks, we were able to reach early on in the pandemic, racial and ethnic minority communities in 14 states. And you can see that in the second slide. So with leadership from local organizations, including HBCUs, we were able to increase access to testing, help community members understand contact tracing, make available more isolation options, and increase access to health care, particularly through federally qualified community health centers um, for persons without a regular source of care. These community partners were able to reach persons, if you look at our third slide, um, they were able to reach persons with underlying medical conditions, um, essential and frontline workers in addition to healthcare workers, but restaurant and grocery store workers, um, construction workers, farm workers. And they were able to reach immigrants and migrants and also to be able to engage early on faith-based organizations. So because of the level of community engagement, there was increased language access by translating materials. And we've translated our prevention messages into dozens of languages at this point. And also by using methods and spokespersons who were known and trusted. And then the national organizations and the academic partners were there to ensure that the information was both medically and scientifically sound. I'm sure you're aware that CDC just announced that we will be awarding $2.25 billion to address COVID-19 health disparities in communities at high risk for infection and severe illness. And the lessons that we've learned through these projects can be applied to both enhance and accelerate on reducing these disparities and achieving health equity in underserved populations. You know, so one I'm, of the things that caught my attention, I think we talked about this very early on within the first six weeks of the virus becoming aware to everybody and people starting to get sick and some of them die, and, was I got a call from a mayor, uh, a really great guy, a uh, real hardworking fellow in Detroit saying to me, Mr. President, you don't understand, this is even before, I wasn't president then actually, he called me Mr. Vice President. He said, uh, you know, it's, I don't think people understand. You know, my community is now about 80% African American and we're dying and getting sick at a much higher rate than the white community here or any other community. 
And I brought that up initially before I put together the group that you're leading and helping lead. And uh, no one wanted to hear it. And remember, the, we had trouble getting your predecessors to track it. But what you're doing really makes a difference. It makes a gigantic difference, as the vice president knows as well or better than anybody. It really, really makes a difference. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Walensky? Any other questions for us? No, but why are you all standing? <laughs> That's the first one. You don't have to stand for us. Why don't you sit down, for real? No Get comfortable. No, they, they have chairs. <laughs> they, they have chairs, but you know. That, that's, that's the first question. Uh, and the second question is, why did only one person clap? I don't know. I mean, that's the same. You know what I mean? I'm teasing. I'm teasing. The reason I do this is the doc knows. You're all too serious here. We owe you a gigantic debt of gratitude. And we will for a long, long, long time. Because I hope this is the beginning and the end of not paying attention to what's going to come again and again and again and again. We can build all the walls we want. We can have the most powerful armies in the world. We can, but we cannot stop. We cannot stop these viruses other than be aware where they are and move quickly on them when we find them. And the one thing that I, the reason I am so, so happy to have been able to, anyway, to have Doc here, is that science is back. No, all kidding aside, think about it. For the longest time, not just, not just as a release of CDC, but science. Science was viewed as, as, as sort of an appendage to anything else we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But it's back. And I just want you to have some confidence that it's not only are the Vice President and I and the whole team and the whole COVID team writ large committed, but the American people have moved. The American people have moved. This is a bipartisan effort now. Now, it isn't showing itself in the way senators and congressmen vote, but the public, yep. the public, we were talking about it on a, on a helicopter, on an airplane, yep. Yep. the public in a bipartisan way. When I came up with this $1.9 billion for this whole COVID and the economic relief side of it as well, we were told that it could never pass. We'd ne never get any help. Well, we didn't get any help in the Senate or the House. But you have 55% of the Republicans in America supporting it. You have 90-some percent of the Democrats, 80-some. The point is the public is thankful to you because it's about science. That's what they understand. They understand. And we're not going back to the old days, even if tomorrow the whole administration changed. I think things have, you've changed things. You've changed them in a way that are going to make everybody healthier in this country. And when we have a crisis, you're prepared to meet it because you speak truth and science to power. And that is, that is the power. So all the folks listening, I guess you said there's hundreds or if not thousands of thousands. people listening. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's an entire generation coming up that is learning from what you've done. I don't just mean learning about how to deal with a virus. Learning about it makes a difference to tell the truth, to follow the science, and just wherever it takes you, and just be honest about it. And that's what you've all done. So we owe you a debt of gratitude of all the lives you've saved. I carry in my pocket, as Doc knows, a, uh, my, my schedule. On the back of my schedule, I have listed every single day with the exact number of people who have died from COVID the day before. I mean, for cumulative. We're at 535,217 dead as of yesterday, last night. Mm -hmm. It's got to stop, but you're slowing it. It's stopping. Yes. And it really, really matters. You know, that's more people than have died and all of World War Amer Americans, all of World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War and 9-11 combined, mm. combined in a year, in a year. And you are the Army. You're the Navy. You're the Marines. You're the Coast Guard. I really mean it. 
This is a war. And you are the frontline troops. Sounds silly to say it that way. Sounds sort of grand, but think about it. And finally, we got the vaccines, we got the companies together, and then the, they didn't have the wherewithal to be able to produce all the vaccines. Mm -hmm. So there's a thing called the Defense Production Act. As president, I'm allowed to enforce it. So I had people saying, stop making that and start making these. Mm -hmm. We found we put together, did you ever think you'd see the day because you've all been involved in medicine, see two major drug, co drug companies cooperate for the good of the country? <laughs> one invent, the, one come up with a drug and the other say, well, we'll manufacture for you. Mm -hmm. So what, what you're doing really, really, really matters, not only, and I'll end with this, not only in saving lives, but changing the mindset of the country. Changing the mindset of the country. And it's affecting everything. Not just affecting people's health, it's affecting their attitude. The attitude about what we can do as a country. Everybody thought that I was, I didn't quite understand when I announced that we were gonna, we had over 100 million shots and less than, you, you remember when I said we're gonna, my goal was to have 100 million shots in people's arms in the first 100 days of, as president. And everybody said, oh, that sounds, oh, yeah, right. Now it's, he should have been more, been, you know. <laughs> Why didn't they say more? You know what I mean? But here's the point. The point is that it is changing the way we look at a whole range of things. And when I announced it, everybody but the vice president wondered why I also pointed out that we landed a rover on Mars at the same time. Because this is the United States of America, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. There is nothing, nothing, nothing we cannot do when we do it together. And that's what you're showing everybody. So I came to say thank you. I really mean it. I have a whole lot of nice notes on here about the science, but, <laughs> I, but I came here to say thank you. Yeah. Because you're not only ch you're changing the psyche of the country, you're saving lives. You're saving lives, but you're changing the psyche of the country. And this is, as I said, I, I, it's not being, I, I, don't, I don't think we're being chauvinistic about our country, but this is, think about it. We're the only country in the world that is every time we've gone into a crisis, have come out stronger immediately after the crisis than when we went in before the crisis. Think about it. About who we are. Closing comment. I was this Xi Jinping in China. I spent more time with him, I'm told, than any world leader because when he was vice president, I was vice president. His president and mine wanted us to get to know one another because it was clear he was going to become the president. I spent traveled 17,000 miles with him in China and the United States and in Asia generally and met with him, I guess, they tell me 24, 25 hours alone, just me and an interpreter and he and an interpreter. And by the way, I, I, I handed in all my notes. Um, <laughs> minor point. <laughs> but, 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 but all kidding aside, he asked me, we were on the Tibetan Plateau, and asked me, he said to me, can you define America for me? And I said, yeah, in one word, and I mean it, one word, possibilities, possibilities. That's what you guys believe in, possibilities, based on science and hard data. And so I just thank you for not only your intellectual skills, but your heart, your heart, your determination. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I shouldn't have done that because I wanted to yield to my vice president, who's smarter than I am. Well, there's not much to add to that, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sorry. No, I, but I will say that I do believe that this administration, with the leadership of our president, is without any question about science. And everyone here knows before the president was president, he was dedicated to science, the moonshot. The, and so, and my mother was a scientist. Um, I grew up, the, the first job I had, little known fact, was cleaning pipettes in her lab. Mm -hmm. um, I was awful, she fired me. Um, <laughs> And then there was this moment of global crisis. And the president takes calls with leaders around the world. We talk with people around the world. And they have named their centers of disease control after this center of disease control. Mm -hmm. 
They put their, the name of their country and they call it CDC. That's right. You all are a model for the world around what can be done based on a pursuit of that which will uplift and improve human condition in life. Mm -hmm. And you guys do this work around the clock. And so we are here to say thank you because it's not easy. You're making difficult decisions right now, some of the most difficult, but you're making those decisions based on science, based on hard work, and based on a commitment to the public health. And therein lies part of the nobility of your work. You do this work on behalf of people you will never meet, on behalf of people who will never know your names, because you care about our country and their well-being. So we are here to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for your visit. Thank you for reinvigorating us. Um, I can promise you as long as this team of people are here, as long as I am here, we will bake into the cake of everything we do our commitment to equity, to science, and to bring back the health to the American people, and to keep it there. Thank you very much. I don't have any doubt about that. If you all don't so learn to sit, you're never going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye, Thank you. Thank you.